All right, why don't we um, why don't we get rolling? It's a bit past and we've got over 30 participants, so that's fabulous. So welcome again, everybody. For most people, this is a, a repeat. You've been with us for the last couple of days, but there might be a new person or two, so I'll go through this quickly. <clears throat> I'm Ian Berengold um, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and have been leading CIP for a bunch of years. Um, under the auspice of the Department of Energy. So it is a, a Department of Energy project that's implemented by NREL. And so we thank them for their support. I don't think um, uh, we have uh, Brett Barker on the phone yet, but he'll be joining later today. Um, so really quickly, um, that's my introduction. Um, uh, quick land acknowledgement here. And again, thank you to Heather for uh, pointing this out. Um, the the NREL and where I am now at my home in my home office is um, on the historical lands of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne people. So acknowledge that. Um, most people have done this multiple times, but because we we do have new people on the phone, again, encourage you to put in your your name, uh, gender designation, and company into the chat as well as this additional information. Um, so that we can, people can communicate. We've had good dialogues amongst the chat. Um, and then also I will post it in there unless Brett, Brent beats me to it, um, a Google form that's out there that is also collecting stakeholder, um, all of your input, all of your information and being a Google document that will be out there. Um, so if Brett does not put that in the chat, I'll get to that in, in a little bit. Um, quickly for today, this is the third of three sessions um, where we're going to talk about uh, some of the procurement and contracting questions. And we have um, our wonderful uh, contract administrator, um, Kendall Jackson, on the line, and she'll do a quick presentation on kind of the contracting mechanism within CIP. Uh, Kendall has been with us since, since basically the beginning of CIP, which is really unusual. So we're really thankful we have someone so experienced in this contracting area um, and so willing to work with all of you um, within the awards because that ends up being really critical. Uh, we'll talk a little bit um, about design tools. And then, as I said, we'll, we'll follow up with um, some kind of additional considerations around CIP and then some discussion around concept papers and, and more of an open discussion around the CIP program. We're always looking for feedback and input um, from all of you about how to improve CIP and make it better for the industry. So always looking for that comments and we'll have a bit of time at the end of today to, to do that. We are still having office hour sessions um, for tomorrow. So if you're interested in, in a little bit more detailed conversation about your technology, uh, please email, um, Brent or drop a little note in the chat saying that you would like to, to have an office hour tomorrow and we can sit down and talk more specifically about your technology or how your technology might fit within the CIP landscape. So best not to have those conversations today uh, in front of everybody, but happy to have those conversations with you as we go forwards. Um, some quick uh, kind of considerations. Again, sorry, everybody, if you've seen this now three times in a row. Um, but all of the information that we talk about today is related to past CIP efforts and should not be assumed to be consistent with any potential future offerings. So uh, we have put out a, uh, a notice of intent that uh, NREL under the Department of Energy plans on doing, releasing a solicitation at some point in the new year, kind of January, February timeframe, um, but that is not a commitment to release one. And any discussions that we have today are not in relation to any new proposal. That's not something that we're allowed to do and it, we don't even know if it's gonna happen. So we've let people know that that is our expectation, but until something comes out, um, uh, we can't talk about it um, because it hasn't come out yet. Um, so any, any of our discussions, any of the questions that we give, any of the presentations are really in relation to what has happened in the past and again, uh, may or may not be applicable to anything that might happen in the future. Once a, a, a call for proposals is released, um, staff from NREL and DOE are not able to talk about it. So now is the time to engage with us about kind of your work or anything that you might be thinking about in regards to CIP. Um, again, we can't talk about um, future um, submissions or anything of that nature, but we can certainly talk to you about your technology and how that might fit into the CIP um, process. 
with respect to previous CIP um, calls for proposals that have gone out. Once a formal uh, proposal is put out there, assuming that it does happen, um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions specific to that um, proposal through a very formalized process. So, or that call for proposals through a formalized process. So, you will have an opportunity to ask questions in a formal way when and if a CIP call for proposals is released. Um, encourage you uh, if you're interested in in CIP and want to keep up with it. Um, please drop an email to the email down there, CIP 2024 at nrl.gov. And um, uh, Kendall will will add you to the list, and you'll get updates from her about any solicitation or notices around the solicitation. Also, encourage you to uh, check out frequently the the CIP website, and we have that link there. Lots of information about the program. Um, <clears throat> la the, the presentations that we gave two years ago are there. Uh, after this recording has been processed, we'll put this recording up there as well as a lot of other fact sheets and information about CIP. So encourage folks to, to go and take a look there. And I will drop that into the chat if uh, if uh, Brent hasn't already done that um, because he's on top of things like that. And then last but not least, we just launched a, a LinkedIn um, group, a CIP LinkedIn group. Um, and so that is there for more coordination collaboration. Uh, and so encourage you to join there. And if you have any information uh, that you would like to share with the wider CIP community, um, that's certainly a location to allow more communication between interested parties as compared to um, emails from Kindle or, or the website, which is communication from us to you. So that LinkedIn is, is more opportunities to, to do cross collaboration between interested parties. So encourage you to, um, to sign up for that if you have interest. Um, last but not least, um, quickly, um, please mute yourself unless you are asking a question. When you ask a question, um, please uh, introduce yourself so we know who you are. Please try to focus questions relative to the content and not dive into your own technology. Uh, now's not the time for kind of detailed conversations around that. Certainly, we're open to conversations, and if you're getting too deep, I'll, I'll uh, myself or Brent will will try to move you uh, to have a separate conversation with us um, because we we want to keep this uh, this discussion applicable to everybody and we also understand that there's IP issues and things of that nature so want to be really careful and conscious about having conversations about technology uh, with small groups of people uh, um, as we get more specific into that. Again, uh, we regret the inability to allow kind of cross uh, dialogue conversations within this forum. It's one of the downsides about doing it virtually, um, but certainly uh, are trying through the chat as well as the LinkedIn page to allow that kind of dialogue to happen uh, amongst this wider community. So with that, um, uh, one last plug for the DEWEA conference um, that is, is happening at the end of February. Again, an opportunity for all of us to meet face-to-face -face and have conversations. Um, around CIP if we are able, um, uh, but then also talk about industry. So again, encourage folks to attend that conference um, if you would like. And with that, uh, open to questions. Um, we'll have more opportunities over the day to, 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 to talk about CIP and then, then clearly that session at the end of the day today to really dig into improvements to CIP or things that kind of concerns or other things that people might have. But uh, quick questions at the start of the day here about anything that's happened over the last two days or other things that you would like to address um, before we turn it over to um, to Brent to dive us into the main uh, dialogue. Or I guess over to Kendall first. Any questions? Please don't hesitate to raise your hand, come off mute. All right, hearing none. Uh, Kendall, are you on? I saw you on earlier. I can. Um... John, did you have a question? You... Yeah, yes, I have a question. Uh, because I'm a new immigrant, um, my English is not fluent. And uh, our turbine is very different with existing and traditional wind turbine. Uh, our products from small to very huge. Uh, but the factory of China uh, was closed when 
before I immigrate to the United States. So we have no facility in the United States. We are focusing on how to financing and to set up a wind turbine assembly, assembly turbine in the United States and uh, achieve the made in USA uh, policy in next uh, one or two years. Mm -hmm. So this is my questions. How can I find support from the no matter from the organization uh, venture or um, some local government? We purpose is to set up a wind turbine factory in uh, middle west of the United States. So okay. this is my question. Thank you. Yeah, no, certainly. Thank you for that question. I think um, probably the best thing to do is to have a conversation um, after this meeting where we can really get into your technology um, and, and see where that fits into CIP. The, the, the CIP program doesn't, does not support um, kind of the, the starting up of manufacturing processes or things of that nature. Um, uh, so that's a little bit harder. That's not something that, that we can do through our program. Um, I would potentially encourage you to, to talk to Heather Rhodes that's, that's here, um, and, and you can see her information in, um, in the chat, because she has done work in that area for other companies. And so she might be someone who could support more in this kind of how to engage with local manufacturing and how to think about the development of local manufacturing. But we're happy to talk with you about CIP and your technology and how it might be applicable in CIP um, kind of after this session today. So if you want to send myself and, and Brent Somerville an email, we'll be happy to set up a time to be able to do that. Okay, I'm recording your email address already. I will send you an email ask for here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, it's our pleasure. And there is Heather. So uh, feel free to drop Heather a line too, as she's done a fair amount of work for uh, uh, around this kind of local development question and, and might be able to provide some support. Great. Can okay. You, do you have slides or, or Brent, do you want to jump on first? Yeah, um, Kendall's going to share his screen and go through um, a session here that we call procurement and contracting. So yeah, we're happy to have Kendall Jackson. She's been with us uh, as a um, contract ad administrator for the whole CIP cycle. And and Kendall, thank you for being here. You can share your screen and go through your slides. And if, if you need any help, let me know. But we practiced and it worked. There okay, you go. great. Thank you. <laughs> thank uh, you. Do you see... Do you see the slides? Yeah. Am I sharing yeah. correctly? We can. Yeah, it looks, okay. looks good. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Ian and Brent. As they said, my name is Kendall Jackson. I'm a subcontract administrator uh, here at NREL with Acquisition Services. And I have been um, helping out with the CIP uh, project for the last several rounds. So definitely have some familiarity with the program and um, just wanted to go over a few different things about proposal submission and, whoops go away um, and the requirements. So um, for the request for proposal, um, if and when um, an RFP is released, it will be posted to SAM.gov. Um, that's where hopefully most of you saw the notice of intent that Ian mentioned. Um, if you are not on the list of interested vendors that we've been collecting over the years, um, you can email that CIP2024 at NREL.gov email address and we can get you added if you're not already on there. Um, but that is where the RFP, um, if one is released, will be posted. Um, so instructions for the submittal of a proposal, uh, the subcontract information, the requirements, the due dates, everything should be clearly outlined um, in the RFP. Um, as, with, um, as far as a timeline, with past rounds, uh, the RFP traditionally has been released in late February. Um, we typically give around a month uh, to submit proposals, so usually due in late March. Um, we try to have evaluations completed in the summer with a goal of completing negotiations in the fall. Um, we do allow for an opportunity for technical questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the date for submitting questions will be identified in the RFP. 
And the way that that will work is once we get all the questions um, submitted by that date, um, we'll compile all of them together along with NREL's responses, and we will post them in an amendment to SAM.gov um, within that RFP um, posting. So when you submit your questions, just know that they're going to be um, posted in an amendment, um, you know, that anyone that looks at the RFP documents will be able to see. We won't be responding um, directly to you, and you probably don't want to include things that, again, are proprietary or specific to your um, actual project. So that's how the technical questions responses will be um, will be conducted. Uh, once we receive proposals, um, we will evaluate them in our against our best value selection. So that includes looking both at price and qualitative merit. So all of the merit criteria will be identified again in the RFP. Um, and each merit criteria has a certain weight, so a certain percentage um, that it's given. Um, once we receive proposals, we go through an initial evaluation for acceptability, just kind of making sure that everything that's required has been received. Um, and at this point, we may um, ask for clarification on something that we're unsure of. Um, and then once we have uh, determine that the proposal is acceptable, meets the criteria, we will evaluate um, it against the statement of work and the merit criteria outlined in the RFP. And at this point, we may engage um, with you in discussions. Uh, once each proposal has been scored, we will notify the successful and unsuccessful offerers, um, and then we will proceed into negotiations with the goal of making an award. Okay. Um, so typically how these subcontracts are structured is they are firm fixed price with price participation. Um, and there's a minimum that will be identified in the RFP as to how much price participation is required. So in the past, um, past example has been 20% um, has been required in previous rounds for several of the topic areas. Um, and then one of the ways that you'll demonstrate that is in the payment schedule, which I'm actually going to show you in the next slide, but you'll basically just show us how you're going to be um, contributing that price participation, both in your cost proposal and in the payment schedule um, for the deliverables. And common types of price participation include labor, equipment, and supplies. If you're unsure about what is considered an allowable cost, um, it's anything that's considered reasonable and allocable under the terms of the FAR Federal Acquisition Regulation and DOE Acquisition Regulation. Um, and I've put down the FAR part um, 31.201-2. Um, if you're unsure if anything is or is not allowable, that's, some, that's a reference you can check to see if the cost that you're proposing um, would be determined to be allowable or not. Uh, when it comes to specifying proprietary and restricted data, I just like to call this out um, because anything that um, you disclose as being proprietary or restricted has to go through a legal review with NREL's general counsel. Um, and if there are things identified in there that are not actually proprietary or restricted, it can just kind of slow down that process. So, uh, for example, in the past, we've had... Um, offers, submit proposals, and basically state that the entire proposal is proprietary. And I'll just tell you now that legal will probably send that back. Um, so just be sure that if you are um, going to assert that something is proprietary or, or restricted, that it is in fact, um, that it's not something that's publicly available, posted on a website, um, it can just make that legal process go a little faster. Uh, within your proposal, you'll also want to provide acceptance of the statement of work, NREL's terms and conditions, both general and IP, or request exceptions uh, to the statement of work or terms and conditions. And then the forms that are required um, are the price cost proposal form, organizational conflicts of interest. You'll complete either the representation or the disclosure, depending on your situation, um, but you don't need to submit both. And if you are a new vendor that hasn't worked with NREL before, uh, you'll need to submit a W-9 and the ACH banking information form.
Um, but you don't need to do that. Um, I wouldn't worry about submitting either of those forms until you've been selected for an award. We don't need um, you to submit banking information with your initial proposal. We'll do that um, during negotiations. Um, and then finally, the representations and certifications form. Um, the one thing that I like to point out with that form is the SAM.gov registration, um, because this can take a significant amount of time. Um, so if you plan to submit a proposal, I would encourage you to get enrolled in SAM.gov early because we don't wanna have um, the award delayed because we're waiting on SAM because it can take a considerable amount of time. So here's that payment schedule I was mentioning before. So since this is a firm fixed price, um, awardees will be paid based off of completed deliverables. So when you submit your cost proposal, you will also assign um, a value to each deliverable that you plan to submit. And within that, you're gonna, um, you're gonna detail both the NREL portion and the subcontractor portion. So again, that's where that price participation piece comes in. So you'll just wanna make sure that in the um, deliverable breakdown that you provide, that you're demonstrating not only what um, you expect to be paid by NREL, but also what the price participation you'll be contributing as well and making sure that you hit that minimum amount. Uh, for property and equipment, Property is going to be defined as anything that has a useful life or value after the completion of the effort. So if there's property that you plan to propose in your um, cost proposal that you plan to take ownership of after the effort is complete, you want to make sure to include that in your price participation because um, basically whoever is paying for the property is who will own it um, in the end. Um, so we want to make sure that whoever uh, you plan to ha have ownership of that after the subcontract is complete, that that's demonstrated in your cost. Um, and then invoicing for post, um, once an award is made, um, you will invoice based on those pre-negotiated values in the payment schedule, um, which is that table above. And then invoices will be paid based on the submission and approval of deliverables. Um, and the, they will be approved by the technical monitor that you're working with. And your invoices will be submitted to accounts payable, and there will be instructions detailed in the subcontract award of how to do that. So, again, um, here is that email address, CIP2024 at NREL.gov. If you have any questions or if you want to be added to that list of interested vendors so that you are notified once an RFP, if and when, if and when an RFP is uh, released, um, we can get you added to that so that you are notified and can stay in the loop. Um, but other than that, were there any questions? Well, excellent, Kendall, thank you so much. It's always good to hear from the experts that use all the right terms and, <laughs> and, know, and know the workflow. Um, properly. So thanks for keeping us straight and, and handling this. Once the RFP goes out, it's really in the hands of, of the office that can Kindle in the office she works for. So um, we appreciate uh, the administration not services uh, greatly. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Heather and Eric both have their, both have their hands up. Just a quick one, Kindle. Hi. hi. Um, I was wondering about slow down provisions for subcontractors and lower tier subcontractors. Do you have a some guidance on what is really necessary given the milestone nature of this program? Um, you can definitely um, propose lower tier subcontractors. Um, we have uh, lots of lots of subcontracts where we have lower tiers. Um, you know, I think the only uh, thing that we want to look at is that, you know, it's not being um, like a pass through where like, a you know, um, like a small business is proposing, but the large business is doing all of the work. Um, that's something that we want to avoid. Um, but as far as I don't think that there's 
any like requirements around lower tiers and we deal with those all the time. Um, we just, we want to make sure that we see um, a similar breakdown in the lower tier as we would from whoever the prime um, subcontractor is that we're working with. So if the lower tier is providing labor, we wanna see labor categories, rates, hours, we wanna see materials, just kind of in a similar detail of price cost proposal um, that we would for, for the direct subcontractor. Um, but if it's a lower tier, we, you know, we're kind of hands off. Um, we would expect whoever the contract is with to manage that lower tier. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Was it? Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I'm just specifically on like the big uh, NREL terms and conditions. If all of that needs to be adopted as a flow down to the lower tier. Um, I believe it applies, you know, specifically, obviously to the to the subcontractor is the prime, uh, mm -hmm. but um, we would want to make sure that nothing, yeah, that the lower tier is doing is in conflict with that. But again, I think as long as um, the subcontractor that we contract with is in compliance, it's, I think that's our, our biggest concern. And then we would expect um, them to manage the lower tier from there. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. The only the only thing I would add to that um, um, is in the proposal. If you are proposing sub tiers, make sure that you talk about them uh, um, from your team perspective. So so part of the criteria in the past, again, no guide of what will be in the future is is an articulation of your team. And if you have defined subcontractors uh, on your team. Uh, be sure to include them because they will be part of that review process, whether they're part of your company or part of a supporting entity uh, that is coming through a subcontract. Okay, uh, Eric. Yes, I have a question concerning the ownership of equipment. Uh, if I understood it right, equipment can be funded <clears throat> by the program. Did I understand it right that let's say, for example, a data logger that would be needed if that is funded by the program that uh, at the end uh, of the campaign, then Enril owns this data logger? So we've had this issue before where, um, you know, at least in the past, it's never been Enril's intention for us to own this equipment. But basically, if the government is paying for something, we technically have ownership of it if we're the ones paying for it. Um, so it's best if um, you can include that as part of part of your price participation. If you can demonstrate that it is your company um, that is paying for the equipment, um, then it you know then there's no there's no issue. Um, it, it, assuming that you want to take ownership of it at the end, and then you could uh, propose more so like your labor, your consumable materials, your lower tiers. Um, and things like that for NREL to pay for. Um, but basically, the government takes a stance that if we're paying for something, we own it. Um, even if I know that the technical team, oftentimes that's not that's not their intention. Um, but that could be just kind of a legal sticking point. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I mentioned this, I think, on Monday. That's why some of the contracts have a higher cost share, uh, price participation, to ensure that um, that stuff that is being purchased is covered by your expenses. The other thing is is to think about consumables. So, Eric, the the data logger might have a life over the over the project or kind of after the project, but the anemometry, and direction veins and all of that kind of stuff is is does not have a useful life after three years. And so so the the anemometry could be on the contract, NREL could pay for that and and it doesn't have a life after the contract, while the data logger does have a life after the after the contract and you cover that on your price participation so that it's clear that it belongs to you. So we can think creatively about how mm -hmm. how to make that happen. Right. Thanks a lot. Paul? Yeah, actually, I, I think my question was um, mostly an, mostly answered. I, it was um, similar to Eric's question. 
Um, I did notice on your presentation, Kendall, that there was the line about equipment and property, I think it was, but along the lines of what Eric was talking about. What, is that is that being presented differently than in the past or is it is that the same? Um, I believe it's the same. I don't I think that the reason that we're trying to highlight it um, in this presentation, and I think this got brought up maybe the last workshop that we just want to make clear um, how this works so that there is not uh, confusion down the road, either when you're submitting a proposal or even when we're in you know the midst of an award, um, that there's not confusion around. Um, this topic and just how it's presented, how it's paid for, um, so that things, you know, that there's no, there's no uh, issue with it and ownership remains with <laughs> who we intend for it to remain with. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. And, and Paul, so just confirming that this is something that has become more important as the, the areas of CIP have expanded. So originally, it was it was very much kind of more prototype development things that were more paper in concept and and therefore there weren't consumer or there weren't wasn't equipment that came out of it. Um, but as we do stuff like the 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 prototype um, manufacturing and installation, I mean you're manufacturing a prototype device. Um, and so we need we are thinking more creatively about what that means. Again, a prototype device, doesn't have life after the the project. So you're making a prototype. It's not like you're selling it. It's not like you can use it forever. It's a prototype. And so we understand that that is in truth a consumable, even, uh, even though it might, it's a piece of hardware, it's a cabinet, it's stuff like that, but it has no useful life because it's a prototype device. And after you test it, we're assuming it's it's it is done its useful life. You're not doing anything else with it. So we can be thinking about, um, and we have thought creatively working with Kendall and our legal team um, to be sure that that stuff that that doesn't have useful life after the term of the project, like prototype equipment, uh, is considered as such. While things that might have useful life afterwards, a turbine tower or a foundation or something of that nature, which which can be used, is is covered under the costs of the part of the price participation. So, if you have any concerns, um, the thing to do is to write that into your proposal so that we know and we're clear. And then, if you are selected, then as we go through the the negotiations around the actual contracting, we can just be very clear about that and and spell that stuff out as we're putting the contracts in place. And again, Kendall and our our legal team is, is very open and and is used to working in in this kind of prototype development, experimental work, and and so we'll work with you to to uh, figure out a path forwards. Yeah, I think some of the some of the work product that that we would make uh, has a number of different avenues from outside of our company into the world, into the the certification channel, a field field trial channel, you know, uh, developing a market and and seeding a market with other OEMs, that kind of thing. So, um, and we want you know that's kind of what we want to see happen with the stuff that yep. we make, you know. Yeah. So you just, that sounds like we just need to articulate that in the proposal stage. Yeah, exactly. And then and then we'll work through it through the contracting phase uh, if and when we get there. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Trond? Yeah, uh, Kendall, thank you for, for going through this. This is very helpful. Um, I have one question, and it's kind of taking the subcontractor discussion we had here at the end um, in a slightly different angle. So we are a Norwegian company, and uh, one of the ways we have been planning to kind of work in the U.S. is to have a subsidiary that then will kind of front our activities in, in, in the U.S., so going back to you know some of the concerns that was there about having you know not having a small company fronting and having really a big company in the back that is actually kind of pro producing and 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 delivering um i see a potential conflict for for some other things that uh, some of the ways we have been 
hmm. maybe looking at um, setting up in the U.S. with a subsidiary, and thereby kind of that will be a lighter shell of you know the some of the activities that is then driven from the mother company. I don't know if I'm explaining this this uh, clearly, but that's kind of where I'm going. Sure. Um, are you, is it a, it's a foreign company um, with an American subsidiary and the American yeah. subsidiary is who would be proposing? Yes, but since General not able to, you know, contract directly with a uh, foreign entity, that was kind of what I had in mind in, in terms of mm -hmm. how to still be participating in the U.S. market and, and still be part of the CIP. Um, I believe that that is, um, that that would be uh, acceptable. Um, I mean, Ian, have we had that specific? Um, I feel like we may have done that yeah, before. No, I, so. so what I would encourage, again, I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm not sure exactly the, the legal contracting, but a, a number of companies, Northern Power Systems is an example. Mm -hmm. EOCycle is another example um, um, of companies. Um, uh, also, Padma, who's on the call here with Siva, um, are all um, companies that have worked through the CIP process with strong foreign engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so that is certainly, again, I don't, I'm not pretending to understand uh, the kind of the legal ease about front, not front companies, but U.S. subsidiaries to larger foreign companies and how that contracting works. Um, but but those are examples of three companies that are primarily foreign um, companies, SIVA, uh, EOCycle, and Northern Power Systems that have successfully and do have current CIP proposals. Um, and so I'd encourage you to reach out to them to, to talk about that, um, yeah. how that worked. Yeah. No, thank you. I I just want to make sure we don't, you know, enter a path that has <laughs> no no um, no end uh, or yes, a, not exactly. a positive one at least. So, so, so we, there are successful ways to do that. We know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. but I'm not an expert in them. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just a question about the same line. In case, <laughs> like, let's say I am submitting proposal, and now Trond also wants to submit it. So, since our products are different lines, we are competing with each other but still can we collaborate and work together uh, in some way uh, irrespective of my proposal in case my doesn't get succeeded his proposal gets succeeded but somehow if we agree and we try to work together so is that a workable or it's a conflict of interest or something like that that would come up yeah no so so at the top level i would say yes there's no there's no issue in doing that do be careful, though. I mean, we all review all of the proposals. And so two proposals that are basically the same thing coming from different companies will, I mean, we'll notice that. And so if you want to submit a joint proposal, more than welcome to do that. Um, one company does have to be the prime because we can only um, uh, do a contract directly for, with one company. So one company is the prime. Uh, another one is a subcontractor. That's perfectly acceptable um, and, and would encourage you to, to dialogue around that. Just don't submit two proposals from two different companies for essentially the same thing and think that we won't notice and hope no, the, that the, one is awarded and one isn't or something of that nature. We'll notice yeah, that. So the products might be different, like design is different, so we can yep. independently still submit it, right? Yep. No. Okay. Certainly. certainly. Thank you. And then I guess I, the, I'm not sure if this is where you were getting, but but the distributed wind industry is very friendly, um, as, as Mike Berge talked about yesterday. And so I would encourage you to engage with your colleagues across the industry, even if you have turbines that might be somewhat competitive. Um, this organization is is here to support, say, DWIA is here to support all of the entities that are yeah. part of DWIA and, and um, are quite friendly, so. Yeah, Mike was helpful, I talked with him, so <laughs> it was a good conversation with him. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Grant? Yes, yes. So uh, let's uh, start and, and, and uh, pick up the thread in, in that end and see, you know, what others have done before and uh, make sure we we follow a similar path so we know it's it's a viable one. Great. Yeah, thank you. 
Great, thank you for all the great questions there. And if you think of more, um, we're, we're here and to contact us um, after the fact or on Friday. Um, so yesterday we had, you know, graduate level courses and standards certification, uh, test field testing and design reviews. Uh, we're going to get a little more technical information today from um, a new CIP workshop presenter, Drew Gertz from Northwind Engineering, who um, is another consultant. Uh, last last year and previous years, we've heard from Rick Damiani, who is a great consultant in this space. And today we're fortunate to mix it up a bit and hear from Drew Gertz on design tools for distributed wind. So I will let you take it away, Drew. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brent. And uh, thanks for inviting me to give the talk today. Uh, just share my screen here. And. Yeah, looks cool. I see it. Yeah, so let me explain my background because I know it's a bit over the top. Uh, <laughs> I was looking over Rick's uh, presentation from last time and he had a really nice title screen, uh, title slide. So I thought I want to make a cool one too. And I enlisted the help of ChatGPT and uh, gave it a few kind of descriptions of my presentation and it came up with this. So I thought it was pretty cool. So I thought, why not put it up there? <laughs> it's got kind of a matrix kind of feel to it. So um with that in mind, let's take the red pill and go down the rabbit hole that is uh, design tools for distributed wind. So I'll just tell you about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, the, the the two options we have for, for loads modeling uh, for small to medium scale wind turbines. We have simplified methodology and elastic modeling. And then once you calculate your loads, of course, you have to validate. So I'll just go over the, uh, the loads validation procedure. And then we'll we'll go a little bit more into air elastic modeling. So what are the options depending on your turbine, and uh, and how do you get into air elastic modeling? <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'll talk a bit about uh, the pre-processing and post-processing steps. And because the title of the the talk was design tools for distributed wind and not loads modeling of distributed wind, I also just mentioned uh, some other useful tools that you can use, kind of pre-loads modeling uh, and more like in the conceptual design and also some tools that can help you uh, during your, your modeling uh, as well. So the simple load model is just as it sounds, uh, very simple, very easy to implement. It's, uh, it's basically just a, a set of equations for each uh, of the load cases. The load cases are described in the table here on the right. So we have power production, uh, fault cases, shutdown, uh, extreme wind situations, and so on. And uh, and and it has some some limitations because it was developed uh, purely for for horizontal axis turbines. Uh, you have to have two or more cantilevered blades, <clears throat> and uh, the blades you can have pitch pitching movement, but it has to be coordinated. Um, the hub has to be rigid, so no teetering, for example. And uh, you're also allowed to have variable speed turbines. So um, as for how to implement the model, David Wood actually created a, a great spreadsheet that comes with his uh, small wind turbines book. So I just wanted to put some screenshots from the spreadsheet just to show you what goes into it. So uh, the, the cells in gray are the inputs. So information about the wind class, information about your turbine, you know, blade length and masses and centers of gravity locations and, and uh, that kind of thing. And also uh, you can even put in the material information uh, for your shaft and blade, and, and it even will calculate your safety factors at the end. So you enter the, the inputs uh, in one section of the spreadsheet and then scroll over and you have your, your loads just like that. So, uh, you know, very easy way to get some, some kind of uh, ballpark loads on, on your machine. Um, although it does have some uh, kind of restrictions, as I mentioned, and uh, not only what I already mentioned, but if we look into the ACP 101 standard, uh, you'll see that uh, it's really not recommended to use the SLM for turbines with a peak power greater than 10 kilowatts, although technically it's allowed up to 30, but but not recommended. Beyond that, you, you really want to go with air elastic modeling uh, because the SLM, uh, because it's so simple, uh, you can't be sure, you, you're not representing your turbine physically in a, uh, so, so you have to apply more conservative safety factors. So I just want to point those out. On the right here, you can see 
if you use the simplified equations, you have to apply a safety factor of three on your ultimate loads. Whereas if you go with the simulation model, the aeroelastic model, uh, because it's more realistic representation and you're accounting for all the important phenomena, you can you can have a lower safety factor. And I'll get into the implications of that uh, in a few slides. But first, I'll just talk about uh, generally about uh, aeroelastic modeling. So it's really a holistic uh, analysis that that combines all the important things: aerodynamics, structural dynamics, controls into 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 a single simulation. And you're running time marching simulations with real time response to all kinds of inflows that you, you can choose uh, uniform inflow, turbulence, shear, gusts. So here's a just a, a diagram from the fast user's guide showing you some of the information that you have to specify uh, in order to represent the turbine. And I'll get it more into what else we have to specify a bit later. Um, and uh, one of the other things that you're able to capture are the structural dynamics and, and vibration mode coupling. So uh, you can generate your basically your Campbell diagram and and see where you would have some uh, potential issues with the resonance with the crossings between uh, the forcing frequencies and the natural frequencies. Uh, so I'll now go into some pros and cons. Uh, the one of the major pros uh, is that you can actually get a really good understanding of how your turbine is going to behave in the field without even building it. Uh, you can represent, because you can represent your controller and, and everything else, uh, it's, it gives you this, this really good uh, insight and allows you to tinker with your design, focus on parameters that have the highest impact, obviously optimize the configuration, and provide a, a more realistic load basis for, for your certification. Um, and as well, if you want to make changes later on, it simplifies the uh, the process. There are some disadvantages. Uh, up until now, it's been mostly horizontal axis centric. So sorry, Vought guys, they haven't gotten too much attention. But um, uh, there are some options if if you if you're not a, a hot. But the truth is, most of the codes um, can't simulate vertical axis turbines, and the kind of publicly available models are mostly horizontal axis. Um, but that is changing. It's getting things are getting better in that respect. Also, there's a lot to learn, and it takes a lot of time. There's a lot that goes into it, and uh, not only time-wise, but computationally. Uh, for a distributed turbine, we usually have to run on the order of 500 simulations, up to a thousand sometimes, uh, depending. Uh, and then we have to post-process those, of course, as well. So, uh, so. Those are some of the cons. And then finally, most codes actually, there's a license fee, so there's a cost for the for the code. And I mentioned uh, the difference in the safety factors between Aeroelastic and SLM. And I just wanted to show you a, a little study I did on uh, a project I was working on where we, we were investigating some variations to a turbine design. So this is variation ABC with, it was with some different uh, rotor sizes and, and some other features. And we actually calculated the loads both with the SLM and with OpenFast. And you can see that generally, after applying safety factors, the aeroelastic results are, are lower, anywhere from 20 to 40, 50 percent sometimes, uh, and fatigue as well. So of course, you have some that are higher, but generally, generally lower. So uh, the aeroelastic model also helps you produce a kind of more cost effective, more competitive uh, design because you don't have so much conservatism on those loads. So once you actually calculate your loads, you have to get into the, the validation of the model. And that's uh, the requirements are also described in, in the standard ACP 101. So with SLM, or no matter, no matter which, uh, whether it's SLM or aeroelastic, uh, you have to measure your power and rotor speed and also the maximums of rotor speed and yaw rate. And I'll get into uh, how they should be measured and the requirements for that in the next slide. Now, when you go to aeroelastic, you have to add the weights of major components that should be measured. And then as you scale up in terms of peak power, uh, they introduce some more requirements. So the blade first, natural frequency, and then uh, tower loads as well above 65 kilowatts. So 
when you're taking these measurements, uh, there are some requirements according to uh, the standard. Now, I should mention all this is being revised and will be updated in the next release of the standard. So this uh, revision is, is uh, being managed by Joe at uh, RE Innovations and the ACP Small Wind Task Group of Brent and Yorn, and also Mike Berge. So I'm presenting you know, how things are now, but there will be a revision coming up. So according to IC standard, uh, you need to use half meter per second wind bins. So this is some data from a project that I was working on, um, doing some measurements uh, testing. And you also have to have data from one meter per second below the cut-in speed. So if your cut-in is three, you have to go down to two, up to two times the average, so about 15. So for example, for this data set, obviously we are, uh, and I didn't mention it, I think 10 data points in each bin. So um, we're a bit low on some of the bins here, but just wanted to give an example. Uh, also, I mentioned the maximum yaw rate and rotor speed. So there's some kind of restrictions uh, if you're using SLM uh, with a passive yaw turbine data. You can't use measured values. You have to use the equation from the standard. And if you have a semi-active or damped yaw, then you can use the measured value in, a, in the SLM. And in these me measurements, you have to see an upper limit uh, in the measured values. Now, for the maximum rotor speed, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you have to measure that speed in, in certain conditions that would be most likely to give the highest speed. So either loss of load or wind gust. And uh, the speeds have to be between 10 and 20 meter per second for two hours of data. And you have to have at least a half an hour of data above and below 15 meters per second. And then once you take those measurements, then you have to extrapolate to your reference uh, wind speed. So I said we're going to get a bit more into air elastic modeling and, and what the options are. So, so this slide kind of gives you an overview of some of the different codes that are available and, and, uh, and some specifications of the codes. So um, the most popular ones in, in my kind of experience are OpenFast uh, because it's free and also uh, Hawk 2. Uh, that's why we specialize in those two codes uh, in, in our company. But there are, of course, some other options um, that uh, some other manufacturers are also using. Um, so if you're a horizontal axis, you have more choice. But if you're vertical, uh, it's a bit more limited. You have Hawk 2, Qblade, and Owens as options. I want to mention some of these codes are actually general purpose uh, multi-body dynamics codes like Adams, Simpac, Samstef, and Alaska Wind. Um, so they're not actually wind turbine specific codes. And then finally, maybe the most important thing, uh, the cost. So only OpenFast is, is, is free. Um, some of these have a trial available or they're available for say academic use or research purposes. Um, but uh, for, the, for that reason, OpenFast is very attractive. Uh, and uh, OpenFast is also open source. So you have the option of even modifying the code. And, and we have done that in some projects uh, to introduce some novel features. For example, we can just go in and modify the code and, and, and simulate uh, these features, even if they weren't available in the, in the kind of release version. So what goes into air elastic modeling and the steps? Um, the first step, which I didn't put here, I would call it kind of step zero is, is actually just collecting all the data. There's a lot of uh, information you have to put together, all the uh, you know masses and geometries and controller settings and structural information and airfoils and, and everything that goes into the model. Usually it's all located all, lots of different places. So you gotta get it all together. And then there's uh, pre-processing steps where you're generating your airflow aerodynamic files, your structural files, your, uh, your frequencies and mode shapes. You need all the properties of your rotor nacelle assembly, controller, of course. So, and there are tools that are used to perform this post-processing, and I'll get to those as well. Then when you have all of that information ready, you put it into your input files. There are several input files that go in uh, into an air elastic model. And then you start your test simulation, assessing the kind of calculated 
mass properties and and other things running some basic simulations to make sure that that you didn't uh, mess anything up and then another big step is actually defining your design basis or your collection of design load cases so uh, this table on the right provides the design load cases for air elastic uh, modeling and uh, the thing is every turbine has its own kind of unique uh, features whether it's on the control side or or something else so you have to kind of work through each dlc and define it properly for your for your machine and that takes time uh, so that's that's usually a, a more time consuming step and then finally the last kind of pre-processing steps creating the the wind files and then you can start your kind of batch runs your simulation runs and then post-processing of course um there's also a lot of it's not just a linear process you know it i i, I could have drawn it more like a loop because there's a lot of going back and forth you know analyzing a dlc uh, finding maybe you made a mistake somewhere or there's something about the turbine that is that won't uh, that isn't working out so you tend to kind of move up and down between these steps um, but plenty of analysis between these two steps and then finally at the end when you're kind of nailed down everything the model is good then you you do your final uh, post-processing where you extract your ultimate loads fatigue loads you look at the uh, blade deflections for example checking uh, for resonance issues and and so on so this is kind of a high level view of all the steps and uh, I'll go in more detail to just a few of them because uh, it would take way too long to go through everything. Uh, so if you wanted to get started with air elastic modeling, what, you know, what practically, what do you do? Well, usually you start with a with an existing model and there's, there's plenty of publicly available models, whether you're, uh, uh, and this is for horizontal axis turbines, this, this table, just to let you know. So whether you're pitching uh, for power reg regulation or stalling, using variable speed, fixed speed, upwind, downwind, you can find a, a model that will they'll be kind of uh, configured the way your turbine is. And then it's a matter of modifying the uh, the kind of all the, the properties of the uh, components. Um, now, there's also plenty of other features that aren't listed here that are included in, in a lot of these models. So you can you can do furling, we can represent teetering, tip breaks, tail um, and uh, and this isn't just for open fast by the way so I'll, I'm thinking hawk to and open fast uh, in my mind so you can do guide towers you can do lattice towers so we can cover you know a lot of different configurations now let's get specifically into open fast and what goes into it so uh, this uh, chart was made by Dr. Jonkman just showing the the workflow, and uh, I'm going to go in more detail in in a couple of the more time consuming steps in my experience, which is um, preparing the airflow data and the structural input files. Um, I'm not going to go through actually setting up and running OpenFast. I'm just going to provide you with a, a link to an excellent uh, workshop um, presentation on OpenFast that that will. That did a fine job and I can do any better. So I figure I'll just link it, link to it for you. And then I will talk about uh, post-processing post as well. So with airflow data, especially with uh, small scale wind turbines, um, you really have to be aware of your Reynolds numbers. Uh, the, the properties, uh, the aerodynamic properties can change significantly uh, when you get down below roughly 500 thousand uh, in terms of Reynolds number. Um, so so the first step is to get this data in the, the linear region or the region between positive and negative stall. And uh, that can come from either a simulator like XFOIL, which is free, or ideally uh, from measurements. And the UIUC uh, database is an excellent resource for wind turbine uh, airfoil measurements, especially at low Reynolds numbers. So I always recommend go look there first uh, because I have done some comparisons between XFOIL and the measurements um, at low Reynolds numbers and uh, there's quite some difference. So I would always rely on the measurements uh, if, if they're available. Uh, 
Now, once you once you have your data, your original kind of data set, then you need to apply the 3D correction. This is the rotational augmentation. The thing about the 3D effects is they're most prominent in the inner half of the blade. So uh, you're going to have, if you take the same airfoil and you apply the 3D correction, say for the inner third of the blade, the middle part of the blade and the outer third of the blade, you're going to end up with different polars. So uh, one thing, even if your blade has a single airfoil all across, you should still have different airfoil uh, polars uh, for your, I usually split it in three or four sometimes. So, um, so you need to apply these corrections and apply them uh, properly for the location on the blade. So you can see here an example. This was an inner airfoil. Uh, so we had the original data and then this, this rotational augmentation really affects your, your maximum lift. And then the final step is the uh, the background polar, we call it, which is kind of the 300, the rest of the data uh, up to plus or minus 180 degrees. And that's done um, also with this airflow prep uh, tool. Uh, the 3D correction is also done with that one. So there's different models. The Viterna model is, is quite common. There's also the Montgomery model. But this um, this basically fills out the, the uh, profile coefficients for you. So structure files. Uh, the blade structure file is the most, um, most work just because usually it's a composite and obviously the geometry is varying uh, along the blade. So in OpenFast, we need it for, we need the structure file for the blade and the tower. So, so I'm just talking about the blade uh, for now, but um, if you have a composite blade, you have some options to generate these cross-sectional properties. Precomp is the freely available tool, but there are some other ones. Um, it's a bit time consuming because you're really describing every detail of the geometry and the structural design. So uh, locations of webs and uh, thicknesses and layup and, and material information of all the different materials that are in there. But, uh, but once you do it, then you can you actually will get your um, distributed blade stiffness and mass properties. And uh, and usually what I like to do is, is check uh, that if I have some measurements, if you already have some measurements of your blade mass and center of mass location, then you can take that data and put it into a kind of a dummy fast run and check the calculated mass and, and center of mass location. And if they're a bit off, from your kind of reference values, then you can just tune the, the distribution a bit so you get it uh, representing your, your blade um, realistically. And then at that point, you put it into uh, the B modes uh, to calculate the mode shapes and uh, frequencies. And, uh, and then that output goes into a spreadsheet, which gives you your coefficients for, your, for the, the mode shape um, curve fits. So, I know it's a lot, but uh, just wanted to <laughs> go over it. Um, now, when you want to run OpenFast, as I mentioned, there's an excellent resource. It was from this um, this workshop, the Nawia workshop, and it was put together by Emmanuel Brownlard. And um, he really goes through nicely through the steps, uh, how to get started, how to run simulations, how to run different kinds of simulations. So I just uh, put, a, put a link here to the location of the of the slides and uh, I recommend you just, just refer to those when you get to this point. And then we will skip over to the kind of post, or oh, sorry, one more slide uh, on the modeling. Um, I did want to mention some some trip ups that I've had that I know others have had, um, just, just to help speed up that learning curve. So um, the time step of the simulation uh, is, uh, depends on, Kind of the, the speed of the of the rotor generally. So there's a there's the rule of thumb, 200 times steps per revolution um, for your kind of highest rotor speed that you expect. So you you have higher or you have shorter time steps for smaller turbines generally. Of course, you can do sensitivity studies and and see at what point you're um, uh, you know if you can increase that time step a bit. But uh, just general rule of thumb. Uh, is 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 that one? So so be aware of the time step. Don't just use whatever is already there. Uh, set up the initial conditions properly for every every simulation. 
So depending on the wind speed, make sure you have the right rotor speed, pitch angle, um, yaw angle if, if you're furling, for example. So um, uh, be aware of that. Uh, aerodynamic models, we have to kind of change them depending on the situation. If you're in a parked or idling situation, you disable the induction, whereas um, some of the models are sensitive to things like high angles of attack or high yaw errors. So you have to really read into the models and be aware that be sure that you're using the right one in the right situation. So I mentioned airflow polars. Um, if you have a kind of more compliant drivetrain or a geared machine, uh, be sure that you set the drivetrain stiffness and damping parameters correctly to get the right uh, frequency. Um, and then, uh, and then, as I mentioned, when you're doing your structural data, you have to tune your distributions. Uh, don't just take whatever you get out of your kind of preprocessor. You have to really validate those to your reference data. And uh, and one final thing I would say is just visualize, visualize, visualize. So there are visualization tools to, to actually visualize the model, both in OpenFast and Hawk 2, um, but also visualize your you know, your aerodynamic polars, visualize your mass, your structural distributions, anything that you can visualize, just visualize it because uh, that'll help you pick out some mistakes you may have made. Um, you know, you can easily add a zero somewhere, forget a zero somewhere and, and throw off the whole model. So uh, those are just kind of my recommendations. And then this NREL forum is great for, um, for getting tips and support from, from the developers themselves. So post-processing, these are some screenshots from the, the reports that we produce. So this is um, basically a scatter plot where we, where we pick out the min, mean, and max values from each simulation in the entire design load basis, so the entire collection of DLCs. So for example, for a time series, we go and pick out the, the maximum and uh, and so we have a good overview of, of uh, how the data is scattered. It's also a good way to discover outliers um, and troubleshoot uh, simulations. Um, but, but in general, what you have to do, obviously, is extract these, these ultimate loads. And, um, and those will be used in the structural verification. Um, you have to produce uh, these contemporaneous tables. So these are, these are um, loads in locations where you have combined loading so you have you know three force components three moment components say at the root of your blade and uh, for every one of those components you have to pick out the minimum and the maximum and then pick out the simultaneous value of all the other components uh, loading components at that location and you actually have to evaluate in your structural verification you have to evaluate all these cases because uh, you don't know just by looking at the numbers uh, which one is going to produce the say the, the highest stress in the component. So that's the point of this table, this loads table. And there are tools available, M Extremes or P Crunch that can help you uh, perform this this uh, post processing. Uh, finally, in the Dash One standard, which is obviously for the larger scale turbines, but I just want to mention it. There are um, Stipulations that you can bin your extreme values. Um, say, for example, you rather than taking the absolute maximum, you can take the average of the upper half um, to so it's not such a extreme extreme, you could say. And um, there are also different safety factors depending on the the load case. So you can refer to those uh, if you're interested. Now we also have fatigue analysis of course so uh, what's done here is you have your time series uh, of your channel and you you apply a rainfall counting algorithm to pick out all the uh, cycles uh, the amplitudes and the mean value and the number of cycles for those combinations and then that data is um, you to calculate a, a equivalent load so a load that would cause the same amount of damage um, if you had a constant for for a particular uh, for a particular constant amplitude, that would be so your design or sorry your damage equivalent load 
would be that value at a chosen number of cycles that would produce the same damage as this um, kind of distribution of, of loading. So, um, but something I'll, I also like to include in our reports is these short-term equivalent loads. So this just tells you how the um, cyclic loading is varying across wind speeds, design load cases. Again, just for a better understanding of the of the the whole the the design load basis as a whole. And there are tools that can help you do this. MLife is a very comprehensive tool, um, but OpenFast Toolbox also has some some functions that can help you with that. Now, um, as I mentioned before, you have to do a lot of analysis kind of in between or before you get into this final um, number crunching and producing your loads tables. And um, we actually have uh, developed a, a web-based dashboard that we run on our simulation server uh, that really helps us to, to quickly and easily analyze the results of our uh, simulations. So I just wanted to, just as an example, because you could also develop your own code. So um, for example, we for a particular turbine, we can look at one or a combination of DLCs um, and we can produce a scatter plot. Say there's a say there's an outlier. You can click on the outlier, and then immediately pops up the the time series of that simulation, and then you can quickly understand, uh, you know, where that outlier came from. For example, we also have the ability to plot the span wise loads, for example, on the blade or the distributed loads on the tower, and uh, uh, for any kind of time step in the simulation, we can click and see that distribution, or we can play back the simulation kind of in real time and watch how these distributions change. And when you hit that extreme load, you can see, you know, the what led to it and, and how the load distribution looks like when you get to that point. So there's a lot of fun stuff you can do in analyzing this data. Now, verification of the components. Uh, usually involves some FEA. There are analytical methods uh, available as well that, on the next slide, but if you're running FEA, uh, just some kind of tips. Uh, be sure of your mesh, of course, and boundary conditions. Make sure you're dis uh, distributing the loads properly, for example, on the blade. Um, if you're analyzing a composite part uh, or non-isotropic material, for example, you have to use the right failure criteria. Um, beware when linear buckling is applicable, when it's not. And don't forget about your welds, stress concentrations, and bolts. Those tend to, to fall between the cracks sometimes. So I mentioned analytic, analytical um, stress calculations. These tables right out of the uh, uh, 61400-2 standard. So um, at the blade root and at the rotor shaft, we can use these uh, equations to, to calculate the, the stress uh, because it is a uniform cross-section. Uh, so, so those locations can be a bit uh, easier to deal with. And when it comes to fatigue, um, there's a lot of good guidance in the Euro codes, uh, Euro code three, um, design of steel structures. There's also the uh, American kind of equivalent um, and, uh, and I would also recommend to read through this GL guideline for certification of wind turbines, which has tons of great guidance on, on uh, structural verification of wind turbine components. For example, this is a plot from the synthetic uh, Wohler curve method, which you can use to generate a Wohler curve for your uh, material if you, if, you, if you can't find it. So this, this SN curve, right? Now, finishing up, I uh, just want to mention some other tools. So these tools are uh, can help you with aeroelastic modeling, setting up the models, analyzing the results. There's this open fast toolbox, there's the DTU uh, kind of version. Uh, PyDat view uh, can help you plot uh, both input and output files. And PDAP from DTU is great for looking at uh, output files as well. And then finally, something that isn't to do with loads modeling, um, some other cool tools that are out there. This wind energy library 
just has a lot of great uh, great scripts for quick uh, evaluations of uh, say a you know BEM performance curve, just steady state, or um, or looking at different stall models, uh, how you know how the results vary, and just a whole bunch of great little tools that you can use or you can implement uh, implement into into your own tools, for example. Um, and then finally, wisdom, which is a quite a heavy tool, but also very powerful. Uh, basically, has optimization capabilities. So I use this for for uh, blade optimization recently, and um, and and it's it's just a just very powerful, uh, capable tool. Uh, and uh, if you spend the effort to learn how to use it, then it can really uh, really push it forward in your capabilities. So thank you. I know it was a lot and uh, I hope some of it was absorbed and now I'm happy to uh, take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Drew, that was great. Uh, Paul Rowan. Yeah, thanks, Drew. That was that was wonderful to see uh, that. I don't exactly have a question, but uh, I, I want. I, I was hoping I might take a minute to expand on on your work there. When, and like the last part that you got to was the component optimization, and we, we've been working in the utility scale industry for over twenty years, really twenty five years, I guess it is now. And we've learned over time uh, the importance of uh, embracing the uh, aeroelastic modeling. We developed a lot of capability in the area of post-processing, post-processing the post-processing, if you will. So mm -hmm. we'd love to receive, and we offer just as, as, at, at no charge, a service to embrace your uh, outputs to configure out pitch actuator performance envelope so we can optimize the implementation of a pitch actuator for the best value. And uh, we also offer a drop-in DLL plug-in that you can put into uh, FAST. And I, I, I think you're, you're probably aware of this already. Uh, in fact, I know I know you're aware of this already. And some, many, of, many of you on the call are where you can put, uh, we have a higher order uh, command generator so when a controller demands a pitch angle, it doesn't just go through a closed loop response. It, it has a trajectory in the same way a fly-by-wire aircraft has. So it's uh, a higher order trajectory. And you can plug that into the FAST model and include that as part of your calculation. There's some, a very few tuning parameters for it that you can test and try different things and avoid <laughs> exciting uh, you know, avoid exciting um, resonances and other structures and so on. But I, mm -hmm. I just, I want, I really want to emphasize the how important it is for the outputs of this kind of work for a for for your your vendors of a if you're a turbine company <clears throat> and you you want to specify some electronics, some actuators, yaw yaw gadgetry whatever it happens to be, you want to be able to take that to your event, your supplier, whether it's Windurance or some other company, your gen we want to know if we're going to dimension diversion load control energies, uh, the, con the converter, the inverter, we want to understand the transient behavior, the service life behavior, and really critically on pitch actuators. It's so much more complex to dimension pitch actuators. There are, I think, eight or 10 dimensions to a pitch actuator performance envelope. And we need to know all of those. And we do take the output of, of uh, aeroelastic modeling and put them into a, it's a relatively smaller set of time series of uh, design load cases that are the design drivers for pitch actuators. But it allows uh, the companies to optimize the best value for the solution. And now the, the nature of our market trajectory being more, you know, starting to move to uh, deploy more on the medium scale where the pitch actuation will become increasingly valuable. 
um, and practical, um, it's being more and more important to do that kind of work. So I applaud your efforts and Rick Damiani and all the guys who have pioneered so much of this uh, aeroelastic modeling. It's just so, so important. And I'm, I'm glad to see that it's embedded in the standard requirements as well, because you can't do it right without it, frankly. It's just you can't. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you for your comment. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, Tim Molson, do you have a question? Are these visualization tools available? Do you want to? Yes. Um, so other than the one I showed that we had developed in-house, which is the kind of web-based um, uh, tool, uh, there are links in the slides, and I guess the slides will be shared. So I, I made sure to link to every tool that I that I mentioned, You can, and they're all free. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on a sharing with the attendees solution right now. I think posting the PowerPoints to the NRL website is problematic. We're, we post the recordings promptly, but I'm working on um, a, a box that we can just share the proceedings with the attendees and as opposed to uh, publishing and, and, and posting on the publicly available website. So um, I'll, I'll, so you're okay with sharing your presentation, Drew? Yeah. With with the attendees. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of links in there. I got a few in the chat, but there's too many. So I started working on a, a box a folder to share with everyone. <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Christine uh had her questions answered in the last few slides. Great. Great. Uh John. I see you. And John, you were looking for Drew's contact information. I believe it's in the chat and um, I don't know if it's in the Google sheet or not, but uh, Drew put his information in the chat that I saw when we started. Right near the top. Right near the top. Any other questions? Guru, Guru yes, Guru thank you. Has his hand. Yeah. yeah, so my question was like, do you provide like a simulation services or something? Like, let's say my design uh, I would like to know what's the output for particular design for different shapes and sizes. So how how do we work uh, on that? Yeah, that's uh, exactly what, what I offer is these aeroelastic modeling services. So we build the models uh, from scratch. So uh, you can reach out to me and, and tell me about your particular design. And uh, I can definitely let you know if if we can model it and we can go from yeah. there. Okay, sure. Thanks. Excellent, Drew. Thanks so much for covering that in a short amount of time. That was, um, I think you hit the, the right highlights. Appreciate it. Thanks, Great. everyone. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we're going to switch gears and just do a little cleanup presentation, additional CIP considerations from Scott, Dana, and I before we take a break and come back and just have an open discussion. Okay. All right, we got Scott Dana here. He's um validation engineer. You know, he's got lots of experience in wind energy at NREL and has been a NREL a CIP technical monitor for many years. So some of you may have worked with Scott before and, and Scott's gonna go over some opportunities for technical assistance as part of CIP. Yeah, thank you for that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. And uh, are you driving or? Yeah, I'm driving. I think, yeah, I think it's, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, yeah, so one one nice uh, aspect of CIP beyond um, just, you know, the, the award money for the different uh, topic areas is uh, the ability to obtain some technical assistance support, um, and it, it can span a pretty wide variety, variety of supports. Um, there's a, a list here with, you know, anything from aeroelastic modeling, um, down to you know certain testing capabilities that might be a little more more unique uh, or difficult to to come by in industry. Uh, we do have a world class 
controls uh, group of controls experts here. So um, keep keep that in mind as well. And then, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, the test capabilities, we do have uh, high bays and they're, they're, they're quite well equipped. Uh, I think we have another slide I can talk a little more about um, some of the, the details there. Uh, and then we have some, some tools, some other tools, uh, TAP, the tools assessing performance. Uh, we have our trademark distributed uh, generation uh, market command uh, decision support tool and the hybrid optimization performance platform. Uh, and, and this technical assistance isn't limited to, to NREL and our capabilities. We, you know, the CIP is a DOE program, so it's open to, um, you know, the, the complex of, of DOE labs. Uh, and if they have a service that would be of value, uh, keep them in mind. So PNNL, we do a lot of work in the valuation space. Uh, INL and uh, even um, we've done some work with Sandia uh, in in the past with some other model uh, air elastic modeling tools. Uh, general guidance here um, is is that we we don't want to compete with industry. So if there is uh, somebody out there that can kind of provide that support, um, we would we would rather have. That money go to them, uh, and not not to NREL. So you know, do your due diligence and and shop it around because we will ask we'll ask you to do that in particular depending on the dollar amount. Um, yeah, and, and it, it, it's going to come down to time, timing, and cost, um, those types of things. Uh, we we do ask that if if you think you are are going to need some technical assistance somewhere. Along the way, uh, include it in your proposal, even if you're not, you know, it's not totally uh, certain what that's going to look like, but you think there's something um, included in the proposal that helps us uh, understand, you know, how, how much um, things are going to cost. And we can start planning for that and making some requests um, from DOE for the program to, to have a, a nice little bank for technical assistance. Um, I think I covered everything there. Let's go one. And yeah, so I mentioned the structural test facilities. We do have high bays. Uh, they're 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 I mean they're used for this type of research all the time. Um, static and and fatigue loads type testing. Um, you know uh, strain strain based sensing. We have load cells and force sensors. Um, we can do all kinds of material handling. You know, they're they're equipped with bridge cranes, things like that. So uh, no problem getting getting something in the bay and uh, up on a test stand. Um, that that's our bread and butter. Uh, we also have some pretty nice equipment for non-destructive type of testing. You know, we have expertise in modal modal testing and acoustic emission. Uh, and then we have some pretty fancy tools with digital image correlation, which really allows for like a large uh, surface strain uh, type measurement under you know fatigue or static static type testings. Uh, and then the pic the pictures there they just give you a little example of um, some things we we've done in the past on sort of the distributed wind scale. Um, okay. The dynamometer, yeah, we do have a small, we call it a small dyno. It's 225 kilowatts. Um, it's it's you know ideal for smaller size motors, generators. Um, you know, hooking up maybe a drivetrain and going end to end through your power electronics. Uh, we can we can do that. Uh, we have load banks um, that, in the images there on the right. You, it's showing the, the drive, there's actually two drives. So one to drive the motor, and then we can put the second drive on your, your you know, your generator um, and feed it back into the system. Or we can put it onto a load bank, or we can put it onto the grid. Um, we've got a variety of options there. And the, the small dyno is, uh, you know, it, it's on a movable test stand. So it's highly configurable, like everything can be 
uh, arranged to fit a uh, variety of equipment or equipment sizes. Um, the high base have embedded threaded uh, anchors, um, inserts, I should say, throughout the concrete floor, and we have bay casts, things like that. So no, no real issue uh, in getting something in indoors and um, on a test stand or bolt down over the floor. It's all within our capability. Um, and then, yeah, uh, so next, oh yeah, and then on the, the maybe grid side or hybrid side, we have that capability as, as well. Uh, microgrid testing, um, I think we do most of that kind of work down at um, our sister campus in Golden, uh, but we do have a distributed uh, wind focused CGI controllable grid interface that should be coming online pretty pretty soon. I think it's been it's been in the works for a little while. Uh, we we've had an existing CGI for a number of years, but it's been dedicated to uh, some of the larger equipment and facilities, the multi megawatt um, dynamometers and and tie into the the turbines that we have on our site as well. Uh, but but soon we'll have one that that is will be ideal for distributed um, testing, distributed wind uh, purposes and testing. Uh, and it it will be we have several small turbines being installed, installed being installed that are going to be linked to that um, that technology. Uh, yeah, and then I mentioned hybrid. So we do, we have a lot of solar at NREL as well. Um, so there's opportunities there to maybe tie into some of the solar that we that we have on site and do some, some hybrid testing. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So some past examples, uh, just kind of walk through these. We have, you'll, you'll see on the left there, that's in one of the high bays where we were doing some blade testing uh, of the Bergy XL15 uh, blade. And so it's on a waffle tree there, um, doing some, some loads, some static loads testing. Um, then in just to the right of that one, you'll, you'll see a vertical axis turbine, that's XFlow Energy, uh, they we we helped partner NREL um, with uh, Xflow and Sandia to advance uh, some modeling capabilities for for bots, and that's actually uh, and that was kind of the the start of a bigger thing that's really um, gained a lot of momentum and and uh, you know the the modeling codes, the design tools, uh, air elastic tools for um, bots are are getting much much better now. So that was. That, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, on, on the air elastic modeling side, we've supported QED uh, wind power and, the, and their turbine. Um, then we've had we've done some magnetic modeling uh, and optimization as well. So again, some of that, um, not just air elastic, but other uh, modeling capabilities at NREL. Uh, and then another, another thing I want to mention is, is we can, we can kind of go to you in certain cases. So we've we've done strain gauge installations. Um, specific example here is for Xflow on their prototype turbine, and that was out at Spanish uh, Fork, Utah. So went out there for a few days, uh, me and one of the technicians, and um, we you know put together a, a strain gauge package and uh, helped with installation and and really kind of train up. Um, you know those guys on on how to do it. Um, so, so something to to think about if you're going to be doing any kind of testing and you're not so sure on the instrumentation or the design of the experiment. Um, you know, think about that. Put it in the proposal. If it comes up later, let us know. We'll do what we can to support. Um, I think that was it. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Or, I think that's the end of the technical assistance slides. Are there any questions for for Scott on technical assistance through CIP? Great, thanks. And so, you know, uh, it, like Scott said, it's easy for us to budget if we 
know about your needs and requests in the proposal, but um, something comes up during the project, um, we, we are, we, we do have some flexibility, but sometimes it's a uh, budget constrained and we have to seek approval for, for any requested technical assistance from the lab network. Yeah, Doug. Sorry. Yeah, quick question. So if you um, believe that some technical assistance might be necessary, but you know, as you stated, we should shop it around the industry first. Um, I'm just curious about the timing of that and if you're putting a proposal together, but also, you know, you want to try to lay that flat with a potential vendor or, or somebody in the industry before going out, um, you know, with the proposal out of men, so you can include them in there. Um, but then should you also, maybe if you're not sure if you might need more support, include the, the technical assistance from, from you all in there too, or, you know, it sounded like there might be some room for uncertainty in that, but just to give you guys a heads up so that you can get that budgeting set up. I don't know if you have any thoughts or clarification there for, for those kind of you know questions that might be sort of uncertain coming in. I think you described it right. Uh, in your proposal, you may just land on a decision, say, okay, this subcontractor is gonna help us with the air elastic modeling, but we could really use in real help with blade testing. And you put it in there and we 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 put a rough budget in. If you need it, great. We've got that allocated. If you don't, that money will go somewhere else. Uh, we are flexible in that manner. And if you didn't think about it until the project's kicked off and you think about it later, then we will we'll try to uh, you know find the money and seek approval for it. But it's just upfront thoughts of what you might need. It does help us allocate a little technical assistance budgeting. Yeah, thanks. And, and it can include both. So you can say, well, we've we've got this person who is working on a subcontractor that we know is working on this, but it would be great to get Jason Youngman or someone else um, because we're doing something a little funky or we need Scott to be able to provide a little additional support because we're not exactly sure whether the subcontractor will be able to do it or even if they can do it, we'd like your help in fleshing it out. Um, just putting that in, in the language uh, helps us prepare a little better. Got it. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right, well, I'll keep going. Um, yeah, a couple of things here. So as Kendall mentioned, uh, these are subcontracts that are deliverable based. You s we ex execute the contract and you send in deliverables to your technical monitor. Someone like Scott Dana or Dave Snowberg or myself, Lee J. Fingers or Heidi Tennyson. And uh, you're paid for the approved deliverable, and that's how it works. Um, so in the RFP statement of work, there will be uh, deliverables described per topic area because they do differ. They all start with the same first deliverable, call it a summary of work effort, which describes the project. And we'll talk about how that's used next. Um, and then there'll be another specific to the topic area deliverable linked to a task uh, and described in the statement of work in the RFP. And then all projects have quarterly reports that come in throughout the period of performance of the contract. Um, and you're, you're keeping us in, informed of progress or anything that happened during the quarter and you're paid for those quarterly reports as well and, and on it goes. Um, keep in mind that the RFP statement of work does have those uh, deliverables um, described, but they're, uh, you're flexible in how you build this table. And so, in other words, you can negotiate subcomponents. You can break a deliverable out into A, B, C subcomponents, which results in more occurrences, um, but also provides opportunities for payments to come throughout the duration of a maybe a large effort within the project. Um, the clock starts on the the, the due dates when the contract is, is executed and you work with your technical monitor to track progress and um, submit deliverables. Um, so uh, we, we, we use a number of methods to distribute information on CIP projects to the public, including press releases, fact sheets, articles, success stories, and maybe within the DOE accomplishments report and as well as uh, DOE progress alerts. Um, so 
just note that materials that are not meant for public dissemination include uh, subcontractor project reports and any material marked as confidential or proprietary. We're, we're pretty clear on which deliverable is used for public um, information. And it's that first one primarily called the summary of work effort where you just put in um, almost uh, similar to your concept papers, a very brief description of the project, the project team, the budget, and all that is used uh, right off the bat for the in-rail communications folks, uh, along with photos, high resolution photos you send in to create these one page front and back fact sheets that are posted to the CIP website um, to help articulate uh, what's going on within CIP and describe the active projects. Um, you know, we'll create these and send them to the subcontractor to uh, review and make sure it's void of any errors or any accidental proprietary information that, that made it in there. And you'll also, in the RFP materials, you'll see there's a uh, attachment for, uh, for uh, calculating the levelized cost of energy. So just want to make you aware that it, there's a spreadsheet for calculating LCOE. So we're all using the same tool and there's an accompanying um, instruction sheet. And you know, LCOE, levelized cost of energy, uh, puts forth the cost of energy throughout the lifetime of the project, all the money on top uh, dollars and all the kilowatt hours on bottom dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, so the installed capital cost is up here. It's up, you know, it's the installed cost. The fixed charge rate is provided in the instructions and we all use the same one. Um, and then you calculate the um, annual energy production uh, based on your power curve and, and include annual operating expenses, which include the levelized operation maintenance costs and any um, occasional replacement costs are included in that too. So capital costs, operations costs over all the energy over the lifetime. Um, and we've got three columns. Baseline is the current cost before the pro proposed project effort, you know, how it is now. The proposal is the expected cost after the effort is complete, after the CIP project is complete. Um, and then end of project is not filled out now, rather it is filled out at the end of the project. So here's where we are now, here's where you think you'll get to, and here's where you got to. Um, that's the intent of the three columns there. Uh, the, if the contract is awarded, then there's uh, their opportunity to write a report on what the end of project LCOE turned out to be. And, you know, like my spreadsheets are, <laughs> if it's green, fill it in. If it's not, leave it uh, to be a calculated field. Initial capital costs, um, you know, basically include everything expected in the normal installation billing of the installed costs of the system. Um, show your, your current costs as best you can and the expected improvements in that second column after the effort is complete. Uh, real installed costs for many turbines are available to InRail, so please be real with the cost estimates um, and try to be as accurate as possible with these calculations. Uh, and here's the, uh, the, the broken down balance of station costs that are part of the um, the cost, total cost to customer. So it's broken down so you could do your best to itemize the, the, the current expected cost. Uh, annual energy production. Um, the, in, we, in the past, we've specified an annual average wind speed distribution shear and height. So that should be included right in the instructions with the spreadsheet. Um, you provide the power curve and hub height for your uh, your particular turbine. Um, and you, you should say, here's where we got the power curve from and uh, whether it's calculated or, or measured. And, you know, another warning, please do not exceed the bets limit with your CCP. And I think we talked about baseline and proposed and uh, your, your pro especially if your project is focused on reducing LCOE, which m some are not, but uh, many are. 
And the losses here on soiling controls, grid, and other losses it depends on which losses were were already considered when you estimated or calculated the power curve. Calculated power curves will have control losses, and the measured power curve uh, will not. So you 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 don't want to double count losses, uh, but you do your best to indicate some. Um, losses in addition to what was already included in the measured or calculated power curve. And, and more guidance, again, is in the included instructions. On ongoing operations and maintenance costs, basically don't put a zero there. You know, there should be something in there for annual maintenance. Uh, there's some guidelines, you know, roughly what, $30 a, a kilowatt per year or something you could go on as an estimate, but it shouldn't be zero. If there are expected replacements, then um, and periodically throughout the life of the turbine, then that goes in the replacement cost, not in the O&M cost, because um, some things are levelized through in the spreadsheet. Okay, so that's it. I didn't want to go too in depth and you know a spreadsheet but just know it's there uh, it's a tool we will all use for, for calculating lcoe and, the, and it comes with instructions all right on this um last bit here i think we've covered it um to further collaboration we've got at least 31 members in our brand new cip linkedin group so feel free to post on there uh it's not publicly findable it's just for uh, you and it's for collaboration and teaming. Feel free to post. We'll, our small group of interested parties will see that. But um, And as mentioned in day one, Heather Rhodes is, is right here on my screen. And she's got that button on her website that says, are you interested in learning more about the NREL CIP tech support opportunities with her phase zero program? And, um, you know, so originally we were going to say, hey, if you're if you're uh, playing in this uh, field as a subcontractor certification body test organization, put all that in the chat. But I think we've got that covered and we've got Guru's uh, Google Sheet and we have a LinkedIn page. So we're hopefully providing opportunities uh, for connections here. And uh, you have anything to add, Heather? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to circle back on timing once more. Yeah. with. Yep. Uh, Kendall's presentation, uh, you know, she mentioned she was talking about the full application process. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day yesterday, we were clarifying. <laughs> you maybe you you say it because there will be a concept paper stage this year. Yep, that's new. And so December to January is concept papers. Briefly describe what you're thinking, send it in, and give us a little time to review and comment. And that'll all happen before a uh, potential RFP, which uh, could come out in February. I that see. makes sense. So the concept papers would probably be due sometime in January? Yes. Okay. Indeed. Okay, no. so then the screening for and, the... Or, Orion oh. says... Oh, no. <laughs> as soon as you get them so but yeah 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 they're as soon as you have it ready send it in and we'll but we will have a due date of sometime in january and is this going to be where like you're inviting or not inviting from that or just feedback we're not uh we're not committing to this first round of concept papers and to doing any kind of down selecting we will use sort of encourage, discourage language. Mostly it's meant to provide some constructive feedback, like doesn't align well with this topic area. Uh, your, you know, your team might, might need this, whatever, but we're not going to down select. So if you get discouraged, uh, you're not uh, forbidden or uh, from, from submitting a full proposal. We, you know, we also don't want to, uh, we're trying to avoid people wasting their time if it's a complete non-match. Um, because there's a lot of effort to pr produce these full proposals. Um, concept papers aren't required. Uh, it, once the RFP comes out, anyone can submit a full proposal. It's an attempt to respond to requests for prompt feedback on proposals. The best we can do is a prompt feedback on, on your concept or idea. Okay. 
And Padma, if you're talking about concept papers, we're working with Kendall's Office of uh, Procurement or um, Contract Administration. They're helping us with a mechanism to receive these concept papers and have them forwarded to, to us for review. And so we'll have all that uh, nailed down soon and we'll communicate you to you about that. And then the, for RFP submissions, that's all part that's once the RFP is out, it's in the hands of the, the contract subcontract administrators, and it's very uh, clear how to uh, submit the um, full proposals. But details to follow on the concept paper submission mechanism. Got it. And, and Joe had, had asked that clarifying question about our concept papers required. And just to restate that, no, they are not required. There's right. actually no, nothing in relation to the concept paper and the call for proposals. Think of them as completely independent. Yeah. Um, we just got feedback that, that it would be helpful to provide more formal feedback um, outside of the formal proposal submission process. So we're open to telephone calls. We're open to meetings and discussions about um, um, your ideas, but then also open to concept papers. Um, and our hope is to provide as much feedback to you before the RFP goes out, because once the RFP goes out, then we, we basically have to go radio silence. Thank you, you Ian. No, of course. Good idea. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Any other so, questions? Does that, yeah, does that radio silence extend to uh, the phase zero? No, because because okay. you're uh, you're not. It, it, it's it's really around people who, who will review potentially sure. review the proposals, and so we're not allowed okay. to to talk about them in a formal sense. Um, that does go back a little bit to um, um, to Brent's question, uh, or not question, but the the discussion of of Brent and Scott about technical support. We will have someone who would be available to help kind of uh, scope out the technical support elements, uh, blade test as an example. So if you want to do a blade test, um, we have people at NREL that you can talk to. Or if you want to go to Sandia National Laboratories and have them do some modeling work for you, it's not NREL specific. Um, that is certainly possible, and we'll identify someone who is not part of the proposal review process um, to allow you to, to chat with them. Great. So, what is this concept paper means? Like, we just explain our invention or something, what's the idea behind it, and uh, just like uh, introductory things, like not much mathematical thing. but Yeah, only a couple... Only a couple pages of here's the idea that we're thinking of submitting uh, and a little bit about the project, the technology, the team. Um, okay. So we can say, yeah, good idea or provide some constructive feedback okay. on, on the idea. Okay. okay. You'll also okay. have to choose a topic area. So it gives us a chance to say, okay, you want to do this uh, effort within this topic area and to ensure that there's a good alignment there. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you. you, Guru. Um, any other questions before we take a short break? All right, let's start back at 4.05 Eastern time, and we'll just enter an open forum discussion about CIP uh, for the rest of our time today. Um, so 2.05, 4.05, at the 05, we'll start back. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Brent. Well, that went by fast. Hey, there's still 30 people. Amazing. Yeah, people want to talk about CIP. <laughs> always good. Always I put good. a link in the chat. I'm always looking at connections. Um, that's a new announcement that just came out today for um, tribal colleges, uh, one in Montana, one in North Dakota. Um, it would just be awesome to get more um, 
I'm called MSI's Minority Serving Institutions Engaged with um, Distributed Wind Research. And um, I don't know if they've ever been part of the collegiate program, but anyway, these are going to be getting some DOE funds. And um, I just love to see more, uh, you know, involvement of uh, tribes and uh, moving forward <laughs> in rural communities, remote reservations. Yeah. yeah. And that's definitely a very applicable place for um, for small wind turbine technology and photovoltaics for that matter. So not not trying to be specific here to um, to to wind um, where there's really strong need. And, and certainly one of the problems problems, it's a very kind of pejorative term, but um, the idea of working in tribal lands is it's really hard for non-tribal people to work in tribal lands. And so if we could get some tribal entities and some tribal youth, more importantly, engaging in wind and solar on tribal lands, I think that would be amazing. Um, that'd be very exciting. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree. I'm going to take some notes down here on this screen while we talk about whatever you want to talk about. Here are some questions we thought about. Um, and I've got a slide showing the topic area so we can say, are the current topic areas adequately addressing the needs? And I've got a, a slide repeating the concept paper information. We can talk about that. But I think it's wide open. And I'm going to try to take some notes. And so, um, Ian, you can help facilitate the discussion because I'm I can only do three things at once. <laughs> we'll see if I can give you a fourth thing to do. Just, just no. pace links. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Jumping jacks while you're doing all this. Um, just really quickly, and Heather, thanks for for putting up your hand. We'll we'll get to you in a second. Just. Um, Stated this in the beginning, and and um, Brett Barker from DOE stated this in the beginning. And I'm not sure if Brett is is on the call yet, but he was planning on joining. We do CIP for the industry, and it's a great partnership between us and industry that has really, I think, um, helped the industry go from where it was a decade ago, which was turbines that were falling apart, weren't cost effective. And clearly, that wasn't all of the technology, but enough of it to be problematic um, from a from a deployment perspective. To where we are now, where we have a great kind of crop of technologies that are going that are either through the certification process or going through the certification process that are less expensive than solar, mm -hmm. that that are are great technologies prepared for where we are now, which is a lot of federal investment and a real strong driver to. Um, explain the deployment of distributed generation, and wind is now able to to kind of truly engage in that market space, which is really exciting. But we're only successful at that by working with the industry to make that successful, because we don't build turbines, DOE doesn't build turbines, that's not our job, our job is to help you. So we're always looking for ways that we can improve CIP to be able to support the industry. So don't hold back no criticism is bad criticism. Um, we're, we're really here to understand how we can improve what we're doing to make it more impactful. So any comments are welcome. And with that, Heather. Okay, so there's nine topics here. And I think we heard yesterday, there's probably not gonna be more than eight <laughs> awards this round. Um, so do you have any sense of which of these are maybe higher priority or, um, you know, what's, what's the guidance on uh, uh, sort of the priority for the funding for this year? Yep. Uh, Brent, do you want to take that or I'm happy to? Well, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, I think I. I'm not 100% sure how to answer that, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> In truth, at this point, there is no priority. So um, 
all of these are, uh, the scoring criteria is fairly straightforward and we will grade any proposal we get based upon that scoring criteria. And um, if a prototype design development scores very high, then in all likelihood it will be funded. Now we do have a little bit of wiggle room in these kind of other criteria, um, but generally speaking, if if there is a good um, a, a good proposal in any of these categories, we will do that. We have a little bit of wiggle room so that if we get thirty prototype development proposals and they're all fabulous, and we get one manufacturing process innovation, we can say, well, we don't need 30 new turbines. We'll we'll take 29 of those or or seven of those and one of the manufacturing or something like that. So we can we can do that. But generally speaking, we try to follow what is scored highly. Right. Now that being said, in the past CIP has focused on um, different topical areas. Um, and we did that probably five years ago where we focused on certification because there was a requirement that had come out through the farm bill to require certified, or sorry, it was a tax incentives, not farm bill, um, saying that you had to be certified to get the tax incentives. So it could be that that um, something like that would happen, in which case we would not release all nine of these, we would release a subset of those. Um, at this, we have not done that in years. And I don't necessarily see a reason why we would um, focus that a little bit more going into the future, but it's always a possibility. Uh, Dean, you have your, your hand up. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I, I've mentioned this before in these kind of meetings, but I, I've always wondered if there'd be a, a possibility of having a little more research-based category. Um, as an example, I mean, I'm always amazed at like how many participants here are interested in the vertical axis world. And that's still, there's still a big gap on the modeling and validated models and that kind of stuff. And it seems like we could kind of really help the industry by doing some more research on validating models, using models, testing various vertical axis and that kind of stuff. And I know CIP traditionally has always been about really getting turbines into the market. And so this is obviously kind of way in front of that type of thing or way behind that. <laughs> um, but anyway, I guess I wanted to just see what, if there's any, appetite for that at all to kind of kind of work more to have a little section that could be more research based validating models um, improving models really or or helping the industry in that way so thanks again for the comment dean um uh, I think we're moving in that direction. Um, I mean, we certainly are in, in the sense that we didn't really delve into it, but um, but a lot of the work that Brent is doing now in trying to improve the modeling and collecting data on turbines, the 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 three turbines that are being installed at the Flatirons campus to be able to validate models. There's a lot of work going on in that direction. But you're right in the sense that what we have not done um, is is from a programmatic standpoint is put a general call for R&D or something of that nature, which could be part of CIP or it could be independent of CIP, but a, but a more open call for research topics from the general community around distributed wind technologies, which, which could be vertical access. The, the, the um, airborne wind industry, this is also a concern of theirs. There's, a, there's not very many companies that could fit into this, this kind of grouping of nine here and they really would love more work in the r d space um the before prototype design development and so i think there is space for that um if if uh, doe had the resources to really invest in that area so we will keep bringing it up and i like the idea of trying to do a more open call for r d um around distributed wind technology 
Um, most of the R&D has happened through the laboratories at this point. Um, and that's probably a little bit of short-sighted from our perspective. So we'll definitely pull that forward. Whether it comes through CIP or some other um, so is, is secondary, but I think your point is very valid. Yeah, I've, okay, I appreciate that. No, I agree. I just, CIP has been around for a while. So it's kind of like, well, if it could sneak into CIP, no, no, there's exactly. some, some ability to like, okay, that, that's an opportunity versus waiting around just hoping something else happens type of yep. thing, right? Yep. And then the other area topic that I would be interested in, in particular is to really do some studies around fatigue and turbulence and that kind of stuff, which I just think affects our industry more than most people could imagine, I think. Yeah, so, no, I'd, I'd agree. Yeah, okay, thank you. Definitely strong, strong points. Yeah, needed work. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Eric's got his hand up. Yeah, just I would like to support what Dean has said. Uh, we have right now lots of customers um, that develop vertical access turbines, and there are lots of procedures, tools, um, experiences that are available for the horizontal access market that are not for the vertical access turbines. And in some parts, it's really very, very hard to offer them uh, to get to a point where they can reach out for a certification not because of the quality of the product, but more of the, let's say, the, the state of the research of the whole supporting market. Right, and I put a link in the chat earlier, but we do have um, this, sorry, I'm gonna Google in front of everyone, a DWAM project that's in year two right now, and it's uh, turning uh, at least InRail's open fast team to the needs of distributed wind um, modeling. And, and part of that is vertical axis turbine modeling, where we're partnering with uh, Sandia to uh, work on the Owens code and the open fast code and, and a coupled approach um, to improve the modeling tools for, for vertical axis turbines. So we, we hope some good work comes out of this um, at least two year project where we're collaborating with 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 Sandia on the the VOT modeling, and then I just expand upon that, saying, I mean, this is a second year of a two year, but but the expectation would be that we would continue that work, um, doing more work and validation, or or whatever the 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 team or the industry felt was important right. or interesting. So I'm sure um, Brent would be more than happy to get feedback on what they're doing there and what the next step needs are yeah uh, and, and it's worth pointing out where I, I mean it was a little obvious in the diagram there but we're working with xflow um, who is a, a cip partner as part of that work to make sure it has real world application any other thoughts on these topic areas Trond? Yeah, I'm um, clearly new to, to uh, CIP and all of this, and I love the whole uh, workshop we're having. So thank you so much, guys, for, for putting this together. Um, one thing that I am, am um, kind of, and I may have missed this, so I apologize in advance, but um, is a little bit around the governance of um, the, the funds and the appropriations that will be awarded. Um, and, and I kind of heard the initial, you know, that it's basically within those, these nine uh, topics, there are, you know, the best ones chosen. Um, but also a little bit kind of a, how is that process being driven from a decision point of view and kind of quality and how do you arrive at the best. So this is maybe more to me that is new to this than, mm -hmm. than others here, uh, but, but it would be interesting to kind of get a bit of a peek inside kind of the decision criteria and, and, and all of this to understand how to put up the best, uh, you know, put our best foot forward in, in mm -hmm. terms of mm -hmm. uh, an application. Sure. Okay. So, um, so we try to be a, as as kind of obvious around this as possible. So I'm happy to dive into it. 
the the first thing is the criteria. And so um, Brent in his first uh, on the first day provided some sample criteria um, that that is used for the for the scoring of the proposals. Um, certainly go back and look at the at the the CIP request for proposals from 2022. And that gives the exact scoring criteria for each one of the um, uh, of the different topical areas. Um, clearly, the past is no guarantee of the future. So when the new when it, the new one comes out, just look at that scoring criteria. Um, and this, <laughs> to a degree, proposal review one hundred and one is if you answer every question that is in that scoring criteria in a cogent way, you're gonna come out with a good, a re relatively good scoring proposal. If you have a solid concept and you can kind of go through all of those criteria and just answer the questions, um, then it's pretty straightforward. Um, what happens under the hood is that there is a group of us um, uh, who uh, a lot of them you have seen on this call, but all uh, within NREL um, who review every proposal and and grade them to those scoring criteria, um, and then we um, we do that for all of the fifty proposals or whatever um, we have and uh, whatever the number comes in, and then we sit down and have a meeting within the whole scoring team to talk through every proposal um, and make sure that we have we're scoring it properly. Everybody agree on the general score. That, that each of the proposals is getting. And then we rank them from one to 50 or whatever that number is. And then at that point, we apply some of this additional criteria to make sure that we're not doing everything in one area, topical area, or all of the proposals are going to a single company in New York. I mean, a company can put in two or three proposals and we don't necessarily wanna fund one company and, and miss out on other companies. So all of those additional criteria that again, Brent um, put forth in that forward proposal or in that first presentation. And, and what's again, in the, in the request for a proposal, it's stated there, these are the additional criteria that we're gonna use. And we basically sit down and go through those and then rank the proposals from, mm -hmm. um, from one to 50. And then we see how much money we have available and we score and we give, money to the first ones that we that we rank the highest. So it really is kind of a, a very structured process, but brings in expertise from uh, a dozen people at the laboratory, all of which who have been working in distributed wind for decades. So it, I think it's a pretty rigorous um, process um, that brings in the best expertise to help identify the companies that are really going forwards, have products that are really viable, um, and have plans to make those products have impact in the U.S. market. Hmm. So I hope that helps. I'm happy to go into more detail, but I hope that helps kind of uh, articulate it a little better. And and yeah. um, I mean to be really clear, if you if you go through the scoring criteria and have really solid answers to each one of those, um, your proposals will score quite well. Um, hmm. Again. Uh, as as Heather mentioned, uh, we get a lot of proposals and we can't fund too many of them because we don't have the, the funding resources to be able to do it. So the competition mm -hmm. is very fierce um, yeah. um, uh, in regards to, to being successful. Absolutely. No, I appreciate that. And I think, I think that that's, that's a good way to approach it as well now in, in advance that, that because, you know, we, uh, we we know that each understood as that each year will be different in terms of the RFP, but also similar. <laughs> I mean, you know, to, so you can learn from uh, from the historic ones in that context. Without question, the, in truth, they have not changed very much over the years. T mm. Little tweaks here and there um, as we go forward, but they haven't changed a whole lot. Very good. Thank you. The major change for this year's merit criteria will probably be the new addition of the diversity um, and equity and inclusivity elements. That'll be the the main new thing. I was gonna, right, the other to thing that, that has changed over the years is adding topics. Um, yeah. For earlier um, uh, uh, stage development, uh, 
originally it was only a, uh, like three topic areas. Hmm. That's right. Is there an overview of the topics over the years that you know has been awarded in terms of kind of where the main bulk goes? uh that's you had a slide on that brent yeah, you? your slide brent yeah the, though it, the it timeline yeah the timeline has it but it doesn't say how many um component imp innovations as an example we awarded as compared to prototype design development so i don't think we've published something that that says of the eight proposals four were this and three were this i mean we do an, an, so Every year we tell you who we who we selected, and in there it tells you whether it's which proposal. So you could certainly go back and look, but I don't yeah. think we've summed that up someplace um, explicitly. To to be really, I mean, just from my from from where I sit, a lot of them are it, most of them are in the component innovation and system optimization. Those are are very high ones that we do a lot of. Um, we try and fund to the extent that we can um, certification because again, that's our goal is to get certified turbines. So if you have a turbine that is um, uh, that has a reasonable cost of energy, uh, comes in within market, um, uh, you have strong plans to develop in the United States and you're looking for certification, those are gonna be um, pretty pretty good proposals to submit because you you've checked all of the questions and and yes. therefore you can submit a really strong proposal now if you if you have a great turbine but but it's coming in at two dollars a kilowatt hour and and really has no hope of of entrance into the market unless you can articulate that your target market is remote Alaska or really isolated places and and it's still very cost effective compared to solar or other technologies and then you certainly have a have have a means to put that in there. But if you've got a good turbine that's been designed for certification, cost effective, you're going to be putting in the United States, and you can document that certification is another really strong one. Yep. And yeah, and Ian's right. You can't tell how many, but you can see that you know component innovation was awarded in every round except for one. Small wind turbine certification is blue dot, and it's popular. Mm. Um, Manufacturing innovation is, has only been awarded in three rounds, a little underutilized, and as well as type certification, the, the green TC that's uh, uh, been awarded in three of the rounds. So you can get a little idea. Uh, hmm. in this, this last one, we had prototype design development, prototype testing, prototype manufacturing and installation, component innovations, small turbine certification, system optimization, and the new commercialization and market development. So pretty, pretty wide um, spread of, of utilization of the topic areas. Hmm. But as, as, as Robert Poist mentioned, we've added more topic areas over the years. And so um, this, yeah. we, we see more dots. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly. Brent, you were talking scoring there. Do you have any idea how the elements for DEIA will be added to the scoring criteria like yes yeah, it's, it's similar to team uh probably in the you know 15 20 percent range and it's in its own in its own block in its own block and the overall so it'll it'll carry a significant weight right if you will yeah y yeah uh again we can't really Pro talk probably. about what's going to happen <laughs> in the future we don't we don't know right. um but but the point being that um that 15 points uh, within the the rubric will take a great proposal and make it non-fundable. So mm -hmm. you're Absolutely. you can't not include anything um, if you hope to to be successful. Okay, for a business like myself with a single male leading the show, uh, you know it's I'm a fan of the fewer cooks in the kitchen, so I try to keep the team lean, right? Yeah. So it's always trying to find a, a, a balance between, uh, you know, these programs that, you know, I, I believe in and, you know, and all makes sense and, and everything. And, but, you know, for an organization like myself, having to then would need to bring in others to satisfy that 15 points. But, so, so not just, necessarily. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. And so let me answer quick, Heather, and then you jump in. Um, no, I, you're right. Understood. 
Now, we're really trying to make sure that, that the ideas of inclusivity are the ideas of inclusivity, and it does not, um, it should not be seen as something that will push against a, a male only company or something of that nature. If you're a male open, only company, but are inclusive in your approach and articulate that um, through the proposal process, then that's perfectly fine. Um, and, and you shouldn't be scored negatively within the scoring rubric because you're not a minority owned company or something Thank of that you. nature. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect answer. Thank you. That's really what I was after, right? Yeah. And Heather, I'm not sure if you're Heather's training. Again, so I we, need to click Heather's link. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say it's not so much about, um, I mean, definitely having um, BIPOC women involved in your project is helpful for sure and in leadership and decisions. Um, but it's not just about like um, who's doing the work, but the outcome of the work as well. So right. how the benefits I, I, are distributed. No problem. Yeah, I think that's a great okay. place to focus on. And as long as that's a hefty part of that 15. You know, you know if you cool. can demonstrate that you understand. Yes, understand. And you value um, right. diversity and what your plans are. Sure. To support that in the industry overall, mentorship, you know, whatever the things you when might personally good, be able to do. Red here, you know, we're going to be looking for locations to do the testing, right? Perfect. That could be on tribal lands, right? Or something like that. that yeah. Would be you know that would have that sort of value there, yeah there's a lot of ways i think that you can demonstrate um commitment to, to that sure. okay thank you for clarifying <laughs> don't oh, don't yeah, want to exclude for this, people for this single white male led <laughs> here right thank you totally i did just want to um had something in the chat um about the dawn breaker so what what always gets me about this program, it's great, but it's just so small, you know, um, in terms of over the last 10 years, how much money total is just being dwarfed by these giant awards coming out in the last year under the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. And I don't think that distributed wind companies are well positioned to access that money. You know, the OSAD process, you had to be up and running and ready to go. Um, same with USDA, you know. And so I would just encourage others here to go ahead and look at that Dawnbreaker, even though we didn't get a distributed win topic this year in SBIR. I don't know what happened with that. But, um, you know, there's other resources out there besides the CIP. And I would just encourage those of you that are interested in the sector to, um, you know, try to look a little more broadly at some of the bigger pots of money as well. The, right. the coal communities, there's just a lot of, of funding coming out through other programs. And I think the, the Carter is an example. Um, Carter's manufacturing one is a perfect example of of a company that has looked outside and has been successful at, in identifying other sources of money that, that you're very right, Heather, dwarf the amount of money that uh, that is available through CIP, unfortunately. So the, I see Mike on the screen and, and Mike yeah. has been great in helping to ensure that the money that is there is there. Yeah. And I'm sure he's pushing to increase <laughs> that amount as well. Um, right. So can thank, I, can I step you. in and make a shameless plug? Um, shameless plug allowed. Go for all it. right. Thank you. So um, you'll... Uh, You'll notice that the amount of money that have been able to fund projects on CIP has increased over the, the run of the program. And the main reason for that is that the Distributed Wind Energy Association has gotten larger appropriations for the Distributed Wind program within the Wind Energy Technology Office. Um, we actively lobby for those funds. Uh, that's not something that NREL uh, can do or, uh, um, you know, any of the other labs, um, but it's, we are a trade association and, um, you know, we're specifically trying to improve the business opportunities for all of our members. We have uh, about 55 members uh, it, and I would encourage you to, if you're not already a member, to take a good look at joining. Uh, we have programs that start at $240 a year, 
uh, and and go up uh, for companies. Uh, they are it starts at six hundred dollars a year. We can bill monthly, quarterly, annually, and that really does serve to support work that will help create R and D funding, uh, deployment funding, uh, different programs. We do get dwarfed by solar research funding and deployment funding, but we've made big strides. I think we've increased the uh, the program funding by a factor of at least four, and uh, we haven't. We're not stopping there. So um, please uh, uh, take a serious look at uh, joining DeWia. You can get some information on the website, uh, and then also um, uh, please uh, consider coming to the conference. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And and it funds a lobbyist who punches way above our industry size weight. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a hell of a job for us. Yeah. Not that we can condone lobbying, but uh, that's right. <laughs> well, you can, but we can. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> Robert can. <laughs> yeah. uh, we we've blown past the end of the official workshop, uh, oh. and I know Christine wanted to wanted me to pull this concept paper information back up, so I've done so before we we run all the way out of time. And again, you know, please stay tuned for these non-mandatory, but hopefully helpful concept paper solicitation in December, which I know December starts tomorrow. So um, we're on it with some sort of due date. Um, you know, we look forward to hearing your ideas and, and, and giving a little bit of chance to, to provide some feedback before a potential RFP comes out. And this is what we're thinking so far. And, and again, the, the, the due date is not the wait until this and that's the point that we'll look at it we'll start looking at these uh correct me if i'm wrong brent and, and yeah I'm fine. we'll start looking at them as soon as we get them but but at yeah. some point we have to stop so uh um, that's it yep so so that's the point with the the kind of the final uh ending date is so that you you <laughs> you don't send us one five minutes before we put out the rfp in which case we can't answer your request so please try to get right. them in before the due date and we'll get, get to them as quickly as we can and, and have feedback back to you. Um, and, and then plugging again tomorrow morning um, for, um, for office hours. And then if tomorrow morning does not work for you, just reach out to, to Brent or myself and we'll schedule a time over the next couple of weeks to have a conversation. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming and sticking with us through our three days of uh, CIP school. Um, I really appreciate the interest. Uh, if, if we get more money, we'll put it to good use because you guys really are good at sending in good proposals. So keep them coming. Without question. And I've got, you know, we're working on, uh, so I think we're going to post promptly the recordings from this workshop. And then instead of trying to go through the long, expensive, arduous process of putting the PowerPoints on the public website, I'll, I'll set that box up to share it with the attendees. So you can get uh, presentations from Joe and Drew and ours uh, promptly. So w watch for that as well. It's great. Yay. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you very much for a great workshop. Thank you for coming. Thanks, guys. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. Hang up late. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice, work. nice work, Brent. Ian, nice work. Guys. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. We'll see you around. Yep. Bye-bye. As you were. Bye.